Welcome to the Twinkle Talks EYFS podcast. Working in the early years is busy, funny, messy and exhausting. Join me, Shana, some of the Twinkle EYFS team, special guest speakers and other early years practitioners as we talk honestly about our experiences. Whether you're listening for CPD, on your commute or to help you relax, Twinkle EYFS will share everything you need to know about all things early years. Hello lovely listeners, it's Shana here with another great episode for you from the Twinkle Talks EYFS podcast and it is an absolute cracker. It is with our lovely early years CPD team, Julia and Louise, and we're going to be talking about the power of play. Now, this is an interesting one because I know if you're an early years practitioner, I bet you already know half the stuff we're going to talk about and this is just some validation for you. And if you're new to early years, well, you are going to learn a lot. But before we get there, we are going to do a fun little segment called Only in the EYFS. Let's see what random things have happened in your day today. James Sarah told us that the most random thing that happened to them today was when they said, yes, that is a bogey. No, I don't want to eat it either. Thank you. Oh, wow. Yeah, we get that offer quite a lot, don't we? For M. Mary, it was a child insisting that their carrot wasn't working at snack time. Okay, I wonder what that meant. Hmm. Sam Wincott had to say to a child today, please don't iron the baby. I'm pretty sure you're not the only one who said that, Sam. Don't worry. Lou Dozer's random event today was when they asked their reception class how they can find out how many toys we have in the box all together and was told that we should go to the shop and buy an Alexa and ask her. Wow, modern times we live in now, eh? (laughs) For guest Jenny, it was saying, if anyone else has any live worms in their pocket, then go outside with Miss and put them back on the grass. Why? Why do they insist on bringing live animals indoors? And for M. Ray, it was sticking evil peas around the classroom for the children to capture. We, we're we a special bunch, aren't we? We do go above and beyond to make our earliest settings magical. Like getting a bag of frozen peas and drawing eyes on them and putting them around the classroom. Yep, we've all been there, M. Don't you worry. There you go. I feel like earlier settings are just full of random events that happen during the day and you catch yourself after and go, hang on a minute. What did I just say? (laughs) What is happening here? But that's the magic of early years, isn't it? And something else that's magical about early years is the power of play. And this is what we base our entire ethos on in the early years curriculum, right? So our wonderful Julia and Louise from the Twinkle Early Years CPD team are going to tell us all about why it's so important. Take it away, ladies. Hiya, Julia and Louise are back for another jam-packed episode today, all to talk about the power of play, ladies. That sounds like a bit of a buzzword. So I'm hoping this uh, episode is going to help me figure out what on earth this actually means. So I suppose we should start from the beginning, right? What, What is play? Oh, well, that's a really hard question to start off with, Shana, actually. I'm sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Because play can actually be quite hard to define because it's so multifaceted. So I would say play is not defined by the end product. It is a process that children go through uh, where they're learning and exploring the world around them. They're making decisions. They're following their interests and they're taking responsibility for their actions or or interests, what they want to do. The research that we've done around play by many different theorists, of which um, Julia is going to talk to us about in just a moment, some key characteristics of play have emerged through the research that we've done, which really helps you to sort of understand the different elements of play. So these are sort of our conclusions of how you could 
define play. So play can be engaging. So when children are involved in play and playful activities, they often demonstrate high levels of engagement, enjoyment and involvement. Quite often children would look like they're having fun, they're smiling, laughing. However, that's not to say that play can't be serious as well. So sometimes you might see children really involved with something and they're still playing, but they're they're sort of looking quite determined and they're finding their play challenging. So it can be quite silent and serious. So play doesn't always demonstrate itself through the fun and the the giggling sort of side it can be a serious action as well, well. that's what I was just about to say isn't like the basis of play being fun and now you're like no it's not actually a play can be serious but it's kind of like a different kind of fun isn't it it's like working towards something as well as enjoyment mm. Yeah, I mean, even though it might look serious, the children or adults, because we can play as well, they are getting a lot of enjoyment out of the challenge that they might be going through. And internally, that is fun. So yeah, so play, play tends to be engaging in some way, whether it's through the levels of involvement or engagement. Also, another characteristic of play to help define play is that children will develop a sense of agency. So they'll have control over the experience. It won't be being led by somebody else. They will be choosing to take part. They'll be directing it and they'll be making the decisions as they progress through the playful activity. So they're not trying to do it to be involved in play to get a reward or for a goal for somebody else, it's true. It's truly led by themselves. So it's like a want rather than a need. They don't need to do it. They want to do it. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so that's two. That's that's the second characteristic. The third characteristic that we discovered and sort of thought that this was a really useful way of helping to define play was that it, it's flexible. So play is often unplanned. There's a sense of unknown and excitement about that and that it can just evolve in the moment. So it, it you're not planning it. It's just can evolve and t- take a different track. And that because of that, it offers children flexibility and going back to that decision making skill that they can sort of craft their play in and and take it on a different journey if that's where their wants and interests go yeah so it it, it doesn't always have rules but having said that play also can have rules and it's... look I was just about to, I, you know what, I'm glad you stuck because I was just about to speak up like hang on a minute when I play games there are very specific rules and I enjoy having rules in my games and a certain way to play why why do why am I not included in this Lou? yeah so 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 this is where it's quite hard. That's why I was going saying to you, it is quite hard to define because uh-huh. we've said it's it, it's fun, but then it also can be quite serious. And now we've said it can be really flexible, but then also part of play is that you generate rules around play and and it can be a planned action. Well, so it's, a, it's just chaos otherwise, <laughs> Lou. Okay, I just can't cope well, with we'll chaos. come to that later when we talk about play with games because that's okay. like a specific type of play that a All lot right, of adults do because children do it when they're later and more developed. Actually. Oh, okay, so fair enough. I'll keep quiet. Yeah. <laughs> so then moving on to another characteristic of play is that it's often imaginative, creative children create different scenarios they take on different roles they might represent an object in us in a different way and so play offers them a chance to see things from a different perspective so then the last characteristic that we have been looking at is that play has to be meaningful so during play children make sense of the world they're making links to previous experiences they're practicing their skills and they're developing sort of understanding for different elements so play is very meaningful to the child but to an adult or onlooker sometimes it might not always be clear what the meaning is and to another child actually but to to a child that's in, involved in the flow of play it's actually really meaningful to them. So, so yeah, so those are sort of the, the elements and the key characteristics that have really come from all the research that we've done that would help to define play. Interesting. And on that last note about it being meaningful, what, what about people, because I'm one of these people, who just like plays 
and doesn't really know you know like so I think it's more the sensory play experiences like if you just see like nice glittery water and you're just playing around with it like Mm. there's maybe not any outward meaning behind that play but I would consider that play for me because I'm like oh sparkly things like it just makes me happy is that the same yeah it doesn't have to be all of these things at once Ah. It often has some of these elements and so you can play and you can not know where you're going or why you're doing it but it's just because you want to explore and you're curious and you're ah. interested but so it's often you know imaginative because that in that case it's imaginative and creative really you're looking at how things are working it's quite flexible because you haven't got an end goal and how you're exploring the water and things like that and it's very engaging for you that's why you're doing it but it doesn't have to be all of those things necessarily in one time yeah and we as onlookers to play can associate what learning is going on as they're playing but children won't be aware of that they'll just be in the moment they'll be engaging with the sensory play or the messy play that like you've said and they'll just be engaged with it and and feeling it and moving it around and um but from an onlooker's perspective we'll be thinking well they're learning about cause and effect or mm. they're engaging all their senses and so that's where the role of the adult comes in isn't it in in that we can look at what children are developing as they're playing yeah and this whole I like that because it's kind of saying you know there will be a meaning behind this play no matter what whether the child's aware of it whether we're aware of it as onlookers or not and I think that is a very important thing when we're thinking about play, especially in early years, because that is why we do it. (laughs) We don't just play. We don't let the kids play for the sake of it. I hate that thing. Whenever you meet a stranger, right, and you say, oh, yeah, I I work in early years. I'm an early years teacher. Oh, so you just play all day. You better duck because I'm going to come for you. Like, that is, don't, that's that's a very poor assumption, a very poor Mm. generalization of what, A, what we're doing as practitioners, but B, what the kids are doing. And that entire definition that you just gave Lou is a prime example of how much is going on that you don't even realize and Mm -hmm. even me as a practitioner me asking you those questions like oh but what about this I've been doing it 10 years and I still don't know you know Mm -hmm. I think there's a there's a lot of work still to be done around Mm. really valuing the importance of play and that play continues throughout your life and so therefore Mm. it should be up there as one of the priorities no matter how old you are this is it because it makes you feel good it does and and I think you get the most creative when I'm playful I get my that's where I get my most creative like problem solving ideas from if Mm. I the thing do you remember that Einstein quote is it insanity is expecting a different result but doing the same thing every time and it's like Mm. well that's what playing isn't playing is doing Mm. different things and that's how you get different results and if you don't play you don't learn and I know that you guys know and obviously our listeners who are early as practitioners and parents very clearly know that play is important but I want you to hear it from you. This is why this podcast is here. You said more work needs to be done, Lou. Let's start it right now. Let's tell the people. <laughs> let's tell the people why is play so important. Yeah, and so we can tell those people that come up to us as well, and people say it's only play, and you're like, well, you don't really understand what play yeah. is, sir. So. Mm, not giving the back end. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So play, play is well, as we've said, it's really, really important. And so for children, it's how they learn and how they create meaning in in their lives and with objects and with other people so it develops them not only cognitively but also emotionally physically socially so it's really powerful so play helps children to as we've mentioned already interact with everything around them to create the meaning in their world with their friends and with each other it helps them to develop confidence and curiosity and resilience and perseverance because children when they're really in the flow of play they keep going and practicing and sort of sometimes repeating things so that they're sort of discovering out how to do it most effectively maybe yeah and it develops their confidence helps them to build relationships with other children and adults and emotionally you know when you're in a state of flow and in play you're actually regulating how you're feeling and if you're not enjoying it you stop it because you've got the choice to in play or if if you're really engaged with it and you're really loving it then you continue and it makes you feel Mm. good yeah I think there's a really good point about that as well 
about making mistakes in play. Like you say, because it's so flexible and because it's freer, I feel like you're able to learn more because you are more open to making mistakes because you're playing. You just play, you're just having fun. You're just messing around. You're just messing around. You're playing. <laughs> but if you put it in a, you know, a structured, maybe, you know, even a test-like situation, then you're like, oh, you don't want to make mistakes. So you're less able to try things. You're less, you know, and you learn a lot less, I think. And I think that's actually a really important part of play, right? Definitely. Mm -hmm. And I think we'll come to it later on about the role of the adult in play as well and how actually adults have got a really important part in involved in children's play because you can really enhance it, but you can also stop it Mm -hmm. quite quickly by interrupting it or disrupting the flow of it. And we'll come to that later on. But yeah, definitely play allows you to make mistakes and it's okay and it's a safe place to be. Right. Mm. It's, I think it's the safest place yeah. to, to be and to learn. And that's, that's why we do it in early years. Don't want to, you know, sound like a broken record here, but it's true. It's so great. You get to experiment without the fear of doing something wrong. Exactly. Which is, there's not many opportunities for, like you say, when things are so structured and I'm expecting B when I give you A. It's kind of just like, oh, well, you go with it and you've, you've got no necessarily end goal, but you're exploring on the, on the way. It's so yeah. free. It is. Yeah. I love it. And let's be honest, right? All of the great minds in our generations and those that have gone by, you know, more often than not, unintentionally stumbled upon things because they were exploring and playing with what they were doing, you know? Definitely. Some of the great discoveries were by accident. And it's kind of like as if, you know, they were playing around with things. Exactly. And how can you expect a result of something you don't know about? The only reason you're going to find out is by playing. Like, we don't... <laughs> can you imagine? It's like, oh, yeah, that's how time machine works. You just do this. That's not how it works. You have to play around and then find out. <laughs> and then you accidentally discover the time machine. <laughs> and, oh, and then we go on to for some fun places. Anyway, uh, yeah, that's my bad. Sorry, I was derailing the conversation. <laughs> but all of this talk about play, right? It must have come from somewhere. Like, obviously, we know as practitioners how important it is and we were taught about it a lot when we were doing our training where did it where did the study on on it and the theory of it actually like start where did that begin well there's so many people that worked on play so there's no kind of oh this just this person worked on play or this person is the most important there's so many theorists that talked about it so in our powerpoint we do touch upon Froebel Dewey, Piaget, Montessori, Szymanski, Rubin, like all these people that contributed to how we understand play, how we kind of understand different stages or how it works in a cycle. And we'll touch on that a little bit, but it's important to recognise that they identified how valuable it was. So Froebel kind of said that play is the highest expression of human development in childhood, which is such a nice quote. He said, is the free expression of what is in the child's soul. Like, <gasps> such a nice thing. Oh, I like it? that. Yeah, it's Stick lovely. it on a T-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and it just shows you the importance that is placed on play. And it was central to Frobolian. I'm not saying that right. Frobolian? 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 Everyone have a go. Practice. And the same for so many. Like Montessori also said that play is the work of the child. And it showed kind of the effort they made to follow their curiosities and the world around them. And it's also woven throughout the approach. Vygotsky kind of recognised the importance of the context and the environment children played in and how they were heavily influenced by places and things and people that they interacted with and that kind of wove themselves into their play. So really children are understanding their daily interactions and everything in their life through play it's so important for their perception of what goes on around them there's a lot of theory about it there is quite a few isn't there and it it can be kind of difficult to get lost in a lot of it because a lot of people will say differing things but from the same strand Julie I remember we were doing we've started looking at the free DV child development training that they've put now online that apparently nobody knows about it's a free course guys I know I think unfortunately it's because the DV did say it's for people in early years and child minders so that makes it sound like not for schools Mm. but anyone who works with early years it's early years yeah it's definitely is an early so, years practitioner so you yeah you know what? i'll put a link in the, i'll put in the link in the episode um, yeah and we're making resources to support it as well because there's not many things like you know handouts or anything to help so we've exactly done that too 
<laughs> yeah so if you're like new to early years and you know you want to get some more on this this is part of the dfe training and like julia said twinkle are making loads of stuff to go alongside with it but there is i'm sure there's a part in one of the modules that talks about how the theories of play developed yeah. and that that's quite a nice thing to look at so yeah if you're interested in more go go have a look there as well as us obviously yeah there's so yeah. much to learn about play we will not be the be all and end all no. of your play understanding absolutely not yeah well that's very good and it's quite nice that it's from different countries and stuff isn't it because obviously like montessori's from italy mm-hmm. hugo's from europe you know there's a lot of other things that happen outside of england lots of other theories from across the world that is quite nice that we get to share with each other and learn from i think that's quite nice about early years right oh i mean I'm sure there's so much more that we need to learn because, I mean, a lot of the theories are very Western. They've come from a lot of the West. So I think there's so much more that we could learn from other spaces of the world. So, yeah. I wonder if there's anybody listening now that knows of who we could look at because that would be really good. Yeah, definitely. That would be so great if people commented about, you know, different theorists and different ideas about play because there's just so much that, you know, you tend to focus on because we are in the West. Mm. So they show you the same things, but it's good to open our minds to lots of different things. Very good point. Yeah, I like it. I like it. Okay, then. So in terms of like play, is there a system for kind of how it works, how it develops? Like, does it look different in babies or as older? Like, Mm -hmm. is there or is it just a free for all? Well, again, this is based on a theorist and just Piaget's work. He when he studied children, he started to believe there were different types of play that would happen at different stages of children's development. So as they would grow, they would kind of explore different types. So when they were younger, they would start with kind of functional play, which is more physical, like running, jumping and kind of experimenting with their senses. And then when they got a little bit older, kind of looking at constructive play, so playing with resources to accomplish a goal, like for example, using the blocks to build a tower. So they've got kind of an end goal in mind. And then a little bit older, symbolic and fantasy play, kind of make-believe, role-play games, and then that can kind of interact with constructive play. And then at the oldest end, he said games with rules, which is what you seem to enjoy. <laughs> so playing I don't know games. what you're talking about. <laughs> Making sure that everybody knows the rules. Look, 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 it just shows that I am at a higher form of play than you, Julia. All right. <laughs> what was the play you said you enjoyed before about the glitter and the water? Um, you know what? It's just like so high that you can't even comprehend it. <laughs> I also remember in our oh. schema... Podcast. I was just about to say schemas. <laughs> that actually your uh, your preferred schema type was very organised. Yes. Yeah. And organized every, gal. Every, I'm feeling very attacked here right now. Hey, no one's saying it's a negative thing. <laughs> you better not be because it makes me very happy when things Everyone are organized. Everyone is special and that's cool. So then <laughs> in terms of, oh, apparently there are some stages. Is that right? Uh, that's someone else. So oh, Mildred no. Parton Newhall came up with stages. So that was kind of built on after Piaget. She looked at play and saw how children's play develops and grows as well and kind of decided on different stages. So she identified six stages. Unoccupied play. So sensory activities that have no focus, <gasps> narrative oh, or interaction. This is my water thing. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Solitary play. Children playing alone for more focused, sustained periods of time with a few resources. Onlooker play. When children watch others play without joining in, which you might see a lot. Parallel play, children playing near one another, but without interacting, but often sharing resources, which happens a lot as well. Associative play, where children play next to each other and share, copy and work together. And then cooperative play. So when children play together and have the same purpose and goals in their play. See, I find these ones really, really interesting because I think especially in like the development matter statements and the framework, you hear a lot about cooperative play and associative play and parallel play. Mm. But onlooker play, you don't really know about. And for me, Mm. I think that's one of the most important ones. These are the children I would always spot. And they would just, like you say, just be on the side, just watching. Mm. And then people would be like, oh, oh, I'm worried. You know, so-and-so is not going to play. And I'm like, I'm not worried. They're just observing before they go in. Like it's like watching how something's done before they try it. And Definitely. that's just kind of the same with play. And I always try to use to explain that to my the children's parents. And they were like, oh, we're really worried. They're very sociable and things like that. But 
initially it takes them a while and they just stand there and watch and I'm like that's that's actually part of the process and that's a that's a good thing they're just absorbing all the information yeah exactly I I think I still do that as an adult you know Mm. when you are in unfamiliar territory yeah definitely and you're sort of out of your comfort zone you're looking to others aren't you to see how people are interacting and how people Mm. are sort of organizing themselves and yeah I think it I think it's a really important part and I think I think we all go through it Mm. at different Mm. points in our life yeah and it's part of understanding the world around us by understanding what other people are doing and I think you see that especially for English as a second language Mm. if those children are coming in they've never been in this environment before it's an entirely different language then they're going to be absorbing a lot of it as well and they might not necessarily feel the confidence to join in with play straight away and it might be very different play that they've seen as well so it's so natural for us to kind of watch that before we feel comfortable oh I th- yeah I think it's perfectly natural and it's really nice that you've brought that kind of to our attention um so it's looking like from these two different types of basically two different things so it's types of play was Piaget mm-hmm. with the functional creative symbolic and then the stages of play is going from unoccupied solitary all the way through mm-hmm. to parallel cooperative I get it okay that makes sense that makes sense and she kind of built on his ideas Oh, I see. Right. So is there anything on that we've got that would, you know, that would be handy to maybe in staff meetings or in handouts that you've got on these things? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you can find all the information that we're talking about in the PowerPoint. So that's a really nice thing to use by yourself or with others to just kind of look through and reflect on play in general and how it works in your setting. We've also got handouts, which are really nice for just to keep in your folders or also little leaflets to give to caregivers to to start help that conversation of the importance of play. Yeah, that's really good. I'll stick those links in the episode description as well. So it's just one click away. Very good, very good. Just as an extra aside, though, there are other CPD resources that we have created that are on risky play and creative play that also sort of mirror lots of this theory throughout them. And we do touch on Froball and Montessori in those resources as well. So it is useful looking at other types of play as well, the resources that we've created. Yeah. It's a lot to cover, isn't it? Play is a big thing. We should yeah. we definitely should not take it for granted. There's a lot yeah. we've got we've got to learn here. Gotta oh, love I that like play. <laughs> I love it. So we've got some questions from our listeners as well now. Um, so these are from people in early years practitioner settings and just want some some help in that. Actually, this first question I really relate with. Uh, First question is, how can adults effectively support play without interrupting their flow? Because this gets me every single Mm. time, especially if you're being like observed and you get maybe senior leaders come in and saying, oh, we're not interacting with them enough. And you feel like Mm. if a a member of SLT comes into the room, you have to go and, you know, interrupt. Like, oh, yeah, what are you doing? Oh, oh, what are you? And it's like, no, they were fine. We've just ruined their jam. What do we do? Yeah, so that's that's a really, really good question. And it and it is complex. There's not an easy answer to that, actually, because play, as we've said, is quite a complex process that children go through. And therefore, it has to be you have to tread carefully as an adult. Otherwise, play can just be stopped as soon as you you try and interact or you try and involve yourself. So there was a another sort of theory, I suppose, which was developed by someone called Gordon Sturrock and Perry Else in 1998. And that was around something called the play cycle. So the play cycle is a sort of a model to enable educators to have a really deeper understanding of play and the behaviours as they're involved in play. And then also how to support the interactions as children play. So the model was uh, broken down into six stages, another theory with stages, <laughs> <laughs> and it went through the stages that children go through as they're playing. The reason why I'm mentioning this is because how adults then support those stages is quite is quite a useful process to think about. So the adult's role in the play cycle was then thought about in terms of four ways that an adult can support the process of play. So the first one was something called play maintenance, which is where the adult just observes the play and watches to ensure that the play continues. In that part, they would only interact in the play if there was an element of risk. And I did that a lot. 
I mean, like observe, not not be like, oh my god, you know, Jimmy's going to fall off the climbing. Frame. Yeah, not. I was like, was it really risky? There <laughs> <laughs> we were menaces in my class. No, I'm yeah, I, mean, so I just observed from the and top. let them be. Yeah, I was like, as long yeah. as there's not an emergency, mm-hmm. I don't need to be here. Yeah, you only interrupt when there's an element of risk, so that children obviously can then probably continue their play, but that you've sort of allowed it to happen in a in a safer and more managed way. So that's the first one that just a, a sort of an onlooker observing role to ensure that play is safe. The second one is called simple involvement. So that's where the adult is still quite passively participating and they don't really involve themselves in the play, but they're acting as a resource. So, for mm. example, they might be providing something that then allows the play to continue. They might find objects or something. They're supporting the play so sort of delicately by being a resource but they're not actually involved observing and providing yeah this reminds me of a time when I literally was a stick for a group of my kids <laughs> I was I was do you need to be a stick well I think it was <laughs> I think it was I must a, know. <laughs> it was a lesson on you know it's not a stick it's a and they were going to be telling right. you everything so just for laughs I think in continuous provision I was like, yeah, I'll pretend to be a stick. What, do, what What? can I be? I'm not a stick. I'm a... And then they'd move me around and tell me what to be. So I was I was a literal resource once. Oh, that's fun. Yeah, it was, it was quite a funny day, to be honest. Not going to lie. <laughs> I mean, we are resources. Be used as necessary. <laughs> so you're almost touching on the next one as well, actually, Shana, because the next way of interacting is where the adult takes on a more active role in their play and follows the cues of the child. So actually, you're, what you're describing is sort of a mix between slightly being the object but also following the cues because you're starting to oh. interact in their play and be more involved and that's mm. that way is called the medial invo- involvement so as you can see we're gradually becoming as an adult you're gradually becoming more participatory <laughs> um, into their play sounds like a real word to me <laughs> that one. we're going with it <laughs> So then the last stage of the adult's role is to is a complex intervention. So this is where the adult is now fully involved and engaged in the play of the child and they're responding to what a child is saying as well as suggesting ways that the the play can can change or could take a new direction and that part an adult is completely involved and the child is now responding to the adult as well as the adult responding to the child yeah and this is the one that I feel like the complex intervention is the one that SLT want to see all the time (laughs) and I'm like look we can't it's not actually right to do that all the time Mm. as Julia and Louise have so rightly pointed out in the Twinkle Talks EYFS podcast, there are actually three other types of play involvement. And this is why I'm stepping back. <laughs> so if anybody is listening and they're being told that you you have to intervene and be a part of the play of a child all the time, come back and tell them this, please. And be like, Julia and Louise said, no, we don't. <laughs> It's a lot more going on. Yeah, and I think I think those stages that we've just described, there is potential for an adult to disrupt that mm-hmm. play cycle. Like I mentioned before, intervening because of safety, offering too many ideas, can then a child go, well, I don't, I don't really, I don't really want to do that. So yeah. actually, I'm going to stop the play now, and I'm going to go and do something yeah. else. Or suggesting ideas that really aren't enjoyed. They're not enjoyable because it's not the choice of the child. And when we go right back to the beginning, when we were saying, you know, what are the characteristics of play? One of them is that it's meaningful to the child and that the child is in control of it. And at the point where an adult takes over, it's not going to be enjoyable because it's not led by the child anymore. No. And in some ways, I actually think that if we interfere too much, it can be quite damaging because Mm. I had a lot of children that for some reason or other, were just not comfortable around adults. Mm -hmm. They would be free as a bird, loud, running around, having the best time of their life with their child peers. But as soon as an adult came, they clammed up, went dead quiet, didn't move, didn't do anything. And so the only way I was going to get a true observation of their learning and their progress is if if they didn't know I was watching them. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? And so sometimes actually being involved can actually do the opposite because it's going to stop them from expressing and learning even more because they're not comfortable to show adults right now. So just Mm -hmm. let them be. 
It yeah. is such a oh. skill of knowing when to, mm-hmm. when you're being given that cue by the child to, that it's okay for you to join in and when actually, no, stand back and just observe. It's, re- it's really tricky. And it's all about, I think, personal space as well. Like, I feel like it's often very much imposed that, yes, we must be there in these children's personal spaces while they play. And actually, that's not... That's not very good PSHG, I don't think, because it's kind of like, well, actually, you need to be invited to mm-hmm. be in that space because that is a play for a lot of children is an escape. It's a safe space for our children. And if we're just constantly interrupting it, then they're not going to feel safe. And actually, we need to be aware of their boundaries as well. Or maybe I'm just getting too into this. But for me, no, definitely. I think especially some of our children who have been in trauma, mm-hmm. and if it's been included with an adult, then exactly. just to impose every time they play, every time we impose and enter that space when they're finally relaxing mm-hmm. and playing, we're, we're shutting down that safe space for them sometimes. So I don't know, you've got to be, you've got to be careful, I think. Mm. Oh, definitely. Yeah, definitely. I mean, early years are such a safe space to explore that because outside, just like you were saying, the interactions with adults may be so, so different. A lot of adults, it may not be appropriate outside to play in certain situations. So they've been told not to play or they've been told do this instead or something's been taken off them. And all those interactions, it makes them wary of adults. And maybe they don't see that many playful adults as well, because we model a lot of play in early years, which is quite unusual because adults outside of the early years might not be modeling a lot of playful behavior Mm. because we don't do that in general like we go to the office we're not like constantly playing <laughs> I mean look early years teachers and practitioners are the weirdos in schools let's be honest like <laughs> everyone's thought weirdos I- as in the best <laughs> yeah obviously but everyone thought I was completely wacko and I'm like I'm just playing around like this is literally my job I have to do this because that's what I'm teaching my children and it's actually quite mm. fun I don't have to sit stand at the front of the class and read off of a whiteboard for six hours a day mm. I get to do different fun things as we're all entitled to do and I think we should encourage that not just in early years but further up as well it's great fun and it's the best kind of way to learn I think yeah you would always see that when SLT would come in (laughs) to my earlier session you could just they were kind of very stiff yes they didn't really know what to do and they wouldn't get on children's levels and they wouldn't you know look in their eyes in the same sense they'd just be like "Mm, what you know they're just immediately physically uncomfortable and we'd be an absolute mess (laughs) I'd be laughing in the corner like "Eh." (laughs) yeah welcome to the madhouse (laughs) join in or get out (laughs) (laughs) you're like you might not want your nice suit on in here (laughs) it's gonna get paint on (laughs) exactly exactly Um, but that's fun. That's nice. I've got a, another question here, which I think is quite on the surface, probably sounds quite simple. It's actually a little bit more complicated. How can I set up a play enriched environment? Mm, that's a very good question, because it's really important to think about what provision you have for children and how you organize and resource the play environment. So it's important to offer children a lot of choices but not overwhelm them. It's like a balancing act, really. And then also for there to be things that are familiar, but also new. So they still feel at home in the space and they can go to those kind of familiar resources if they're not feeling super safe when they first arrive, for example. But then they also have things to explore and challenge them so that they can kind of take their play in new places as well. So it's important in general for the environment to feel comfortable and home like if possible so that children do feel that level of safety because they don't feel ready to explore unless they are comfortable Mm -hmm. so they can't do that real deep play unless they feel safe in the space and what's really nice to provide is open-ended and kind of loose part resources because those things can be taken anywhere like you were saying you know what can you use a stick for that's such a great resource isn't it because you can be using it for absolutely anything you can't even imagine what the children are going to come up with sometimes so that's a really nice thing to put in your environment especially when the stick becomes a person as well stop i know (laughs) surprise the stick can talk (laughs) but talking about resources and obviously i know we all know resources are important i think space is also important and i don't mean you know to be Uh, successful at playful environments you must have a big space because a lot of our nurseries and earlier settings don't have a lot of space at the minute and they're 
struggling for space and especially you know like uh, pack away nurseries they've got even less space mm. but it's about the different kinds of space so sometimes having open spaces sometimes having really cozy spaces maybe covered spaces like it's quality over quantity in terms of the spaces right mm-hmm. yeah I mean when you think about spaces you're kind of thinking about going back to schemas as well because some mm-hmm. children like being enveloped and enclosed so having like you say cozy spaces and then other children you know you need to have freedom to move because if places are too crowded then it often leads to more directive teaching or less chances for them to socially interact and move around as they're as they're playing so yeah physical space is really really important and and again it's getting a balance of having cozy spaces large spaces outside spaces where children can move and be physically more active Mm. and also I think as well I'm just thinking about how we designed our nursery layout a lot of the tables are like specific sizes and that you can fit eight around a table or six around you know like stuff like that and sometimes things aren't always built for that many children and it's okay I think I remember speaking with you guys about on another episode that yes we of course we encourage social play and children to make relationships but it's not a bad thing to want to play by yourself and I think yeah making spaces for solitary play as well Mm -hmm. as group play or paired play like that's something to be aware of as well maybe oh definitely I mean even if you think about yourself if you were exploring something and you were constantly with other people do you really get to focus on your own ideas or your own interests and follow that path you need that time by yourself as well Mm, yeah great look at this I'm learning so much (laughs) this last question I think is my favorite because I I got asked this a lot from parents when I was in school so the last question is parents have approached me to say their children quote unquote just play Mm. how can I share with parents how important play is yeah this is a really important question and one that I'm pretty sure that every early years (laughs) educator has been asked and I think it's something that we just have to know that it's coming as well (laughs) instead of like oh this again because it's something that in general most people do not understand the value of play so it's so important that we share that with parents and you can do that in so many ways I think a great way to do that is actually to invite them in and to even do sessions together to even talk to them about why play is so valuable so what we're talking about today talking to them about that also helps deepen their understanding of what play can look like and why it's so valuable for their overall development because they're often very focused on end goals you know I want my child to write I want my child to read well play is so important if you don't playfully learn to do those things they won't enjoy it and they won't do more of it and they won't Mm. be you know they won't get to that stage so play is so so important and it's just talking to them about why it's important I think having those conversations and making links between home settings and earlier settings and giving suggestions of things to do and why because I think sometimes when we say oh do this at home we're like why what's the point Mm. (laughs) really explaining that helps them to understand why play is so valuable yeah and I remember I used to get parents that say for example if we were going to do like a topic project for half term because we didn't like homework in our setting. I was like, early years children do not need homework. Their homework is play. (laughs) But then you'd get the parents that didn't agree with that and be like, oh, well, actually, I want my child to learn as if learn was separate from play. And I had to be like, yeah, but especially like during um, COVID and lockdown and I had to have like 44 nursery kids on a Zoom call. You can imagine how successful that was. Yeah. And you had, you know, obviously (laughs) we had to, you know, set, home learning tasks because you know I could only have them on zoom for half an hour at most if I was lucky a day and then the rest they were on their own and so the home learning tasks that I would give the families were play-based and then I'd get parents coming back at me going but why why is it not you know learn x amount of letters and x amount of no and I'm like but they are they are doing that Mm. this is how they get there Mm. play is an important process of that and it really it really took them on a journey of, oh, actually, if I don't do this, if we don't play here, if we don't get this stuff, there's no need to even think about the future there. Because if they're not doing it here and learning it through play and just playing 
and developing cognitively, physically, emotionally, socially, then mm. there's no point. So it is, it's weird, isn't it, that we don't get taught about this because we all go through it. Yeah. It's mm. a whole different lens basically on education. Like the problem is, is that all of us as a population do not understand early as play. Like even within, if you work in a school or even if you don't work in a school, you'll have friends, you'll have colleagues that do not understand our job. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. basically when you meet parents, you, you have to explain that because no one really understands it unless they've almost studied it and value it in the same way that we do. Yeah, it's madness. But look, this episode <laughs> is the star. <laughs> and we've got some great resources on site already. Leaflets that you can hand out to parents. And also we've got a new resource in the yeah, making. This would be Ooh. really nice. Yeah, Ooh. so this is a, a PowerPoint that we're creating at the moment that is going to uh, be a really useful resource that you can explore with other educators in your setting as well as with parents on what children are learning as they're playing oh I like it I'm excited mm. to see that when that's live then great oh, nice. and of course you can tell your parents to listen to this podcast yeah <laughs> <laughs> we're here for them too <laughs> oh, we're here for everybody early years doesn't matter we love everybody To end our wonderful episode, we're going to play a game about play. Mm -hmm. We're going to play again. Oh, yeah, yeah, I just realized we play at the end of every episode. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we like our game with rules. <laughs> yeah, some more than others. <laughs> I generally bend the rules when we play. You games. are very <laughs> flexible. Let's say that. <laughs> the can take and leave the rules. <laughs> yeah, they're like an option. More guidelines than actual yeah. rules. That's from a film that I can't remember. Um, <laughs> that you don't agree with. <laughs> maybe. Maybe I'm learning from you guys. Maybe I'm learning to, you oh, know. really? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That lasted a long time. <laughs> I know, I tried. I tried. I wasn't fooling anybody. Um, this game is all about play. And as we've done it before, I've asked you some questions beforehand. And you filled in some answers, but I've taken away who's written the answers and I've muddled them all up. And we've got a guess who the answer belongs to. Okay, you ready? Mm -hmm. Oh, ready. So the first question we ask for this game is, what is your favourite memory of playing as a child? Oh, oh okay. that's nice. I bet I'll get this in one. Number one <laughs> is playing with bouncy balls or conkers. Ooh. Number two, being outdoors, playing in the garden, making mud pies and potions and hiding in various places. Ooh. And three... Playing in those adventure park things like giant pirate ships or mazes you would get at, at a resort near a beach or at a restaurant back in the day with the ball pits and the foam obstacle courses and the like. The feeling of excitement was such an adrenaline rush, right? Mm. Balls and conkers, outdoors mud pies and adventure park things. Who's who? Mm, you both like gardening, so you could both be the mud pies. Oh, I don't mm. know. See, I think mud pies has got to be Lou because it's messy play and that's what you do in your adult life, my love. Mud pies, potions, I think that's you. Yeah, it does sound like you. So, big reveal from me is... Oh, I wonder what it is. <laughs> is yes, I am the mud pies and hiding in different places. It does places. sound like you. Lou. Yeah, yeah, that's cute. Yeah little child Lou I know and I used to it's, uh, I spent a lot of time outside as a child so. mm. yeah. that makes a lot of sense you love the outdoors I do and messy mm. play so I'm gonna say the adventure playground and adrenaline experiences is Julia it's not <laughs> it's me <laughs> we wish you could see Lou's face because the surprise is unreal. <laughs> Why are you surprised that I love adventure? What What well, is the issue? I did debate between the two of you, but the reason I went for Julia is because a couple of podcasts ago, there was something that was really quite daring. That she... And it was in the Risky Play one. Oh, so I thought that that might be her. Mm. Oh, that makes sense. That makes sense. Now it's me, mate. Oh, when you were it. like restaurants back in the day 
back in their day. Do you remember? Do um, your sound amazing. I don't think I've ever been to these places Have in, you in the back not? of a restaurant. Maybe it's a northern thing, but there was this. Oh, what was this restaurant called? Charlie, Charlie something. Charlie Chuck. I can't remember, but it was a restaurant. You go for like, you know, your family, it was like a family restaurant. You'd have your smoke inside, your non-smoke inside. And, and then they had a ball be, pit. They'd have a big ball pit jungle gym thing what? inside. And it was all padded and you get to play That's around. Well, I don't remember those. I just remember what? a big elephant slide. Yeah, you used to slide. go down the, t- down the trunk of the elephant. You just have a slide. That oh no! Amazing. It was it was br- it was so much. I still remember it like vividly. Twenty something <laughs> uh, years later, like no, it, they were so fun. Like that. Oh no, it was great fun. I probably avoided them. <laughs> Every time I used to go and see my grandma and granddad down in Devon, we'd go to Remington Beach or something like that, and there was this big pirate ship outdoor wooden jungle gym, and it was just that sounds so good. It was that so much fun. Good. We used to go there in the summer. So, yeah. So that means then, Julia, you like your bouncy balls or your conkers? <laughs> I'm a simple girl. <laughs> I honestly really struggled. I don't know if I have like a, a shocking memory, but I was like, what did I even play? I oh. loved a bouncy ball. Still now, when you go to yeah. shops and there's a whole thing of bouncy balls, the instinct is just to pick them up and start bouncing them. <laughs> really I can understand that. It's weirdly satisfying. And also, I don't know why, but would like drop them on all the different surfaces to see which one would bounce the most. And I was like, well, I couldn't possibly be bouncing it on this surface. It's not going anywhere. <laughs> so you get yeah. the concrete ones and just whack it down. And you're like, okay, now I've lost it. <laughs> well, you just go it down, put it downstairs endlessly just to watch it bounce down all the way down. Oh, yeah. yeah, that was me be told off a little bit yeah great okay question number two where is your favorite place to play in an early years setting oh okay hard question yeah this is hard okay the first one is outdoors all the way and any activity in the outdoors involving (laughs) sensory and messy play i wonder who that could be (laughs) two the water tray when there are lots of bubbles on an area for painting to explore color mixing and then the last one is outdoor jungle gyms. I loved climbing the ropes and the slides and rope bridges. My favorite thing to do as an adult is go ape and ninja warrior challenges. So I think that's where it comes from. Okay, mm. so outdoor messy play, water and bubbles, or outdoor ninja warrior. Now, I do wonder if it's quite as easy for people that are listening as it is for us, because I yeah, think it's so, so obvious. Easy. It's really obvious. <laughs> anything outdoors, Lou. Not yeah. subtle. <laughs> Uh, anything messy play, Lou. No. Yeah. Although I could be the water. No, no. you could. <laughs> <laughs> no. That's like too outdoors. clean. No. Yeah, it's too clean for you. We need to I get some messy. I do love messy... water, though. I do but love water. Water outside with puddles and putting paint in puddles and see mess. Yeah. Not just water. You like to make it dirty. Yeah. 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 So That's yeah, I you. am the messy outdoor. We know. <laughs> Surprise, surprise. Yeah. So, Julia, you must be water tray then, of course, with bubbles. Yeah, yeah although quite controversial because I thought it could quite be you to, to begin with, Shana. Really? Because you were, meant, you were mentioning the sensory. Oh, I was. That's true. You like the glitter in the water. Yeah, yeah. I do really like water. Episode. I like I your do. definition of controversial. <laughs> I know. Controversial. That could have been you. Yeah. <laughs> Breaking news. <laughs> everyone <laughs> hold on to your hats as soon as the next one came in i knew it wasn't you so. yeah. yeah i mean clearly outdoor jungle gyms is me. yeah it yeah, sounded obviously. very like your obviously what you liked when you were a kid as well yeah. exactly i was like this is too similar to my first answer but <laughs> no, it's what i love here. i can't help it mm, just telling the truth it is yeah exactly right last but certainly not least this is a very good question what do you like playing with as an adult so number one i like to draw and play dress up mm. Number two, I love nothing better than exploring new places and finding natural treasures. Mm. I love the sense of freedom and the endless possibilities you can have with little treasures you find. It's so satisfying. Mm. Recently, I was away searching along the shore for sea glass and beautiful shells, taking photos of beautiful moments which inspire my creative craft projects once mm. home. Ooh. Wow, what an answer. Wow. My goodness. What an answer, Julia. <laughs> Obviously, that was you. <laughs> Number three, I like playing with crafts. I knit and sew and make candles. And just this weekend, I made friendship bracelets with my bestie. Who says crafting is just for children? That's you. Obviously, That's it's you. me. Obviously. 
we did make friendship bracelets oh, it was great that's, that's adorable nice. did you put anything on them like well letters. we did I'm not sure i can say it on the podcast though because she was going to a taylor swift concert uh, in the cinema i was gonna say uh, yeah <laughs> And they, apparently it's a thing. I'm not it like a Swifty. Thing, yeah. I don't, they, apparently they're bringing friendship bracelets to swap with other yeah. people. It's very ah. cute. Yeah. So one of the friendship bracelets we made was um, F the patriarchy. <laughs> no. Nice. Oh. It looked really pretty though. <laughs> <laughs> but it looked real cute. <laughs> it looked really cute. So yeah. It's like, yeah. So you know, friendship protests, like, but looking real cute. <laughs> yeah. I think it's one Love of her it. songs or it's one of a lyric in her songs. Ah. Isn't it? I d- again, I'm not a Swifty, so I couldn't tell you. I just she just told me to to make it. That's what I did. So <laughs> following orders. I'm just following what's following that? the rules. There you go. That's what I was just following directions. Direct and play. <laughs> there you are. See. Okay. Draw and play. Dress up. This has to be Lou because you went away, Julia. Recently, I went away searching on the shore. You went to Italy, so it must that must be you. So. It surprises me that Lou likes to draw and play dress up. Have I got this the wrong way round? Yeah. Yes. Oh my God, I have. <laughs> when you said, oh, that's obviously you. I was like, it why was. would I say that after my own answer? <laughs> I thought it would. Honestly, I thought it would. Because I was I like, thought oh, it yeah. screamed Lou. I was like, Lou just went away. She went to the beach. She loves looking but for things. I also <laughs> thought, I think a couple of podcast episode games ago, we were talking about your favorite things and you love going away and I history. And, and I was like, oh, maybe that's why. Oh, well, to be fair, it was very hard to choose. Oh, I, I do also like looking for pretty things on the seashore. Oh, okay. Well, what, the seashore. You say play dress up. What do you like? To, what do you like to dress up as? Um, I Halloween. Mean, I'm more like every day. It's just fun to play with my clothes. <laughs> I feel it like is. you have to take an opportunity to enjoy dressing up. And, and oh, I, I like that. I'm going to try that more often. Because otherwise, it, it makes me feel good. Sometimes I'm like, yeah. oh, this is fun. Putting together. You heard of that thing, things dopamine things dressing? Happen. Yeah, exactly. That's a, that's a form of adult play, I think. Don't yeah. mean dressing. Because I think at one point after COVID, it was I was genuinely working in PJs. And I was like, yeah. hmm, I'm not feeling so good about this. So made an effort to play and I dress like up more. Even if I wasn't going anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that tomorrow. Yes. <gasps> Let's all dopamine dress tomorrow. Yes. Yep. Fun. <laughs> okay, great. Cool. So that means then, Lou, I'm so sorry I got this wrong. Yeah. Where did you go away? Where did you find these beautiful sea glass? Well, it's a combination of different places. I was on Mersey Island in Mm. Essex recently, and it's known for oyster shells. And so, and they were just all over the beach. So I wasn't necessarily picking them up and taking them. Oh, I was just enjoying picking them up and looking at them and yeah, and just, you know, making arrangements on the beach. Oh, did you take pictures? Yeah, to to share them with us. Yeah, can you please share them with us? Yeah, of course I can. Yeah, so just I lo- love the natural world. So anything in the natural world inspires the crafts and the things that I do at home. So yeah, maybe we should do like a social post about what we do as adults yeah, for playing. That'd be fun. Yeah, you can that do would your be so yeah, and we can. I can show you my friendship bracelets with the swear oh, words cute. Oh, bl- blocked out. That. Yeah, <laughs> and then like our listeners could join in too and show us their dopamine dressing and all the stuff that they do as adults playing. Oh, nice. Yeah, I fun. like that idea. All right, I'm going to do that. What a way to end the episode, guys. That's so cool. Now, obviously, everybody knows they can look at the episode description to find out all the resources we've talked about. You can find us on the website and stuff. But uh, I think that's a wrap for Power of Play, my ladies. What a lovely podcast all about play. (laughs) I know. Aren't I we hope just everyone amazing? goes goes and plays now. Yes. Yeah. This is if this is your sign that you needed to go have fun. Go have fun. Do yes. it. Yes. Get it. that glittery water. <gasps> those bubbles. Ah, oh, bubbles. Bubbles. I like it. Great. Cool. Well, that's it. Thank you very much, my lovely ladies, and I'll see you uh, next time. Yes. Bye. 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 Great. Thank you so much, ladies. That was a great podcast. Great episode. We all know the power of play, don't we? Don't we? I don't know. I don't know. I've always been a massive advocate for play. And I'm hoping that if you weren't before this episode, now you are. Very exciting. The ladies have been working on 
so many exciting resources and things for you to check out if you need support in perhaps maybe training your team on the power of play, maybe educating your school if you're attached to a school, supporting parents and families, loads of stuff. You know where to find us. Go on our website, twinkle.co.uk. You'll find everything you need there. And of course, on our socials as well, if you want to ask us any questions. But that is the end of today's episode. I really enjoyed spending time with you and I look forward to the next one. See you real soon. So that's it for today's episode. I hope you really enjoyed it. If you would like to join in or would like to know more, then come and find us on our social media sites. We have a Facebook page, Facebook groups, an Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, Pinterest, and YouTube. All the links of where to find us will be in our podcast description. Come and join the conversation. And whatever you're doing today, I hope you have a great day.